Welcome to Black Man Live, Lab Live. We are here on Monday. What is today's date? Huh? All, all these days are turned into one day, man. I apologize. Monday, uh, September 28th. We are excited to be here tonight. We have a great panel um, tonight with us. Uh, I'm going to be um, co-facilitating tonight with my man, Fred Parham, my yeah. brother. Yeah. All those people I paid, Marty worked out. There we go. <laughs> glad, glad to have you back with me, Fred. Um, also, we got my man, my brother from another mother, uh, Molly Davis, who is normally the co-facilitator, is uh, on the road, but he's here, and he, and I was going to bring him into the space real quick. Molly, baby. He's having some technical difficulty. Oh, there he is. Molly, can you come on? You're on mute, brother. He got so he's he's having some problems. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just there you are. I'm here. Okay. What up, what up, what up, what up? Black man live. How we doing, man? We just on the road traveling back from uh Sylvania, Georgia. Uh, dealing with the Julian Lewis case, the brother who was uh, shot and killed by a state trooper on August the 7th. So uh, glad to see everybody. Let me see who's in the house here. Ah, Durante. Ah, G. White. Samora Sabukwe. El Namante Garside. Uh, we got a crew. This got is a crazy. Crew. I understand. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm going to get out the way. Brothers, we just want to um, uh, thank you all for being a part of this. And uh, for everyone that's watching around the country now, uh, thank you all for supporting Black Man Lab. It's really about creating safer, safer space for black men in particular, but black, for black people in general. And we're just really appreciative of uh, our ability to connect one to another and just to love each other. And that's one of the things that we don't talk about much or as much, but the need for us to love ourselves in a way that uh, we recognize the sanct sanctity and sacredness of black life uh, in a way that, you know, we build family, community. Um, and as my brother G. White will say, you know, start with your house then take it to your neighbor and then block by block. We don't organize. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Marty, man. I don't know what my connectivity might be. We're on 16 on these in, in South Georgia. But um, thank you, Black Man Lab. Yeah. Love you all. I love you too, bro, man. And be safe, man, because those roads down there, uh, we spent some time down there last week. And that's a, that's a separate and different kind of world down there, man. So. Uh, keep yourself safe, man, and your head on a swivel. And uh, from there, we'll keep pushing. Uh, but like Molly said, man, it's about love. It's about um, us as black men coming together uh, to to find ways to continue to move um, our people forward, right? Um, we know that we start with our community. Um, and to Molly and Gary's point, start with our homes, which is kind of what we're going to discuss tonight. Um, and, and then we move into our communities and uh, to the country and into the world uh, to do whatever we can to make this, this this world a better place. And we definitely need it now. So um, with that, uh, one of the things that we do, we have some traditions that we do. We, we start each week with making sure that we are in a space of um, and being centered and being allowed to, to take on information um, and, and do it uh, un, un, unabashed and, and doing it in a, in a way that we are opening ourselves up to, to what the creator has for us. With that, um, we always start with my brother Fred, um, just getting us centered. Um, and then from there, we're going to run to one of my other brothers here on, on, on the panel and a member of Black Man Lab as well, Brother Jared Grant, that will bring the ancestors into the space. We know that we stand on the shoulders of all those that came before us. So first I'll start with uh, Brother Parham, if you could get us center. Absolutely, Marty. Glad to be back on the show, especially with this important topic. 
at the forefront on our minds. <clears throat> I don't want us to miss anything. So brothers, we're gonna dispense with all of the struggles and trials of today and all of the anxiety for what is yet to come. And we're gonna place ourselves comfortably in this moment. And how are we gonna get there? Follow me. Everybody assume just a posture where you're sitting erect and uh, you're gonna just take a deep breath on my count. Inhale, three, two, one. Exhale, let those shoulders fall. Again, black men, inhale, three, two, one. And let those shoulders fall. Feel your fingertips and your toes and be in this moment and get ready for the wisdom of these men on this panel tonight, Marty. Let's go. Appreciate you, brother Fred. Thanks again. Um, and and also, just when we are normally in our in our space that we are all together, one of the things that we do um, is we we open up the floor to loving each other, right? And so what that means is to to Fred's point, we talk about um, hey, if you've had a rough day, if you've had a rough week, a rough month a rough year, or dare I say it, a rough life. Um, we are open to reach out and put our arms around you and say, brother, we got you. And although we are in a virtual space right now, we want you to know whoever's listening in out there, I want the brothers on this panel to know, brother, we got you. We got you. And we're, we're holding you. Um, so with that, I want to go on over to brother Jared. Jared, you, you got your, you're off mute now, you good? I'm good, brother. All right, if you could bring the ancestors into the space, man, and, and get us real real solid and ready, I'd really appreciate that. Will do, thank you, Brother Marty, uh, and thank you, brothers, for joining us tonight. Um, I'd like for us to uh, think about some of our ancestors and put them in our hearts and mind. Let's think about some of those ancestors that, that, that brought us to where we are and, and is helping us to achieve what we need for the future, but, we, we, we rest on their shoulders. And so think of some of the ancestors internationally throughout the world that we know have, have achieved some great things. I want you to take about two or three seconds to do that. All right, you locked them in your hearts and mind. Now, everybody raise your fist. And on three, say, Ashe, one, two, three. Ashe. Now I want us to think about some of those national ancestors, those on the soil that in which we live on, uh, that impacted us in, um, in, in such a close way here uh, that we look to model ourselves uh, on. Um, think about them um, for about, and put them in your heart and in your mind for about three seconds. Now everybody raise your fist. One, two, three. Ashe. All right. And last, brothers, um, there's, uh, there's a group of ancestors that literally made you. That literally, um, your blood is a part of their blood um, and brought you onto this earth. And to do the great work that you're doing, the great work that you're going to even speak to tonight, um, um, it's because of them. Put them in your hearts and mind right now. For three seconds. Now let's raise our fists. And one, two, three, say Ashe three times. One, two, three, Ashe. 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 All right. Welcome. All right. Appreciate you, Brother Grant. Thank you so Thank much, you. man. Um, with that, let us move on into our discussion. Um, first, brothers, what I would like is if, uh, if everybody could give a quick introduction of yourself, um, and then we're going to get into the conversation right after that. So I'll, I'll start with you, brother Durante. If you could give an introduction of yourself, give yes, a little sir. bit about your background. Absolutely, uh, Durante Partridge, um, father, husband, um, Lakers fan. I'm an attorney as well here in Atlanta. My law firm, Lions Den Legal. Uh, we practice in the area of uh, entertainment law, uh, as well as intellectual property, amongst other things. Glad to be here tonight amongst the brothers and, and Black Man Lab, for sure. 
Man, glad glad to have you, brother Durante. I like how you slid that in there, Lakers fan. Man, we're <laughs> like, gonna let everybody know, huh? Okay. Yes, sir. All right, we he, back, man. You're doing all right right about now. So yes, congratulations sir. on that. Thanks again, brother. Glad to have you here, uh, brother Samora. Uh, good evening, brothers. Um, Samora Sabukwe. Um, I'm a father, uh, husband as well. I have two sons, also educated, been in education for 15 years. I uh, also own a business where I teach um, financial literacy and economics to, to black youth in particular, and especially at risk youth. Uh, so that's my concentration. Uh, always excited to be here and uh, have to be here with all the brothers tonight. Man, we are excited to have you, brother, because uh, I know on a regular basis, you and your son, uh, is time uh, on the Black Man Lab. You've been part of our uh, gatherings as well. So glad to have you here. And uh, yeah. thank you for being on the panel. On the, uh, on brother, the... brother Monty. Good evening, gentlemen. How are you? How is everyone? Um, my name is Monty Garside. I am a Atlanta native by way of Tampa, Florida. So I was born in Atlanta, lived most of my life in Atlanta, but I went to junior high, junior high and high school down in Tampa. Uh, I'm also an attorney here in town. I uh, work for a firm called Regal Legal Services uh, here in, based in East Point. Uh, I also um, am a, a, a work for a real estate development company as well as their chief counsel. Uh, so I kind of wear both hats and I'm also a small business owner. I own a, a, a cake, cake business, uh, dessert and catering company. So I'm a busy, busy man, a father of an almost two year old and uh, um, uh, definitely a family man myself, and um, I'm really, really excited and honored to, to be a part of this group this evening. We are excited to have you on, brother, and we are really excited that you were able to be on having a two-year-old. Uh, <laughs> likewise, having a cake business, we might need to talk after this as well. Yeah, so. Absolutely. I got you. I got you. <laughs> uh, thank you for being on, brother. Appreciate it a lot. Um, my man, brother Gary White. Uh, the good doc, who uh, is one of our great intellectual minds, Brother White. A good afternoon once again. Um, I, I like the order the way you all presented that, so I'm gonna kind of follow in that lead. I'm Dr. Gary O. White. Um, I'm one assistant professor at Clark Atlanta University, uh, the Whitney M. Young Junior School of Social Work, where I teach a host of um, courses related to the Black family. Um, um, evaluating clinical practice with Black family, research surrounding Black family. Um, and I do all my research, particularly around fatherhood, Black fathers, uh, as well as the Black family. Um, I'm a family therapist as well. I've been doing that work for 20 plus, um, 20 plus years. I'm also a member of Let Us Make Man, in which I do the workshop on restoring the Black family. So anyone who's been in that know that I'm always arguing, start with myself, then the family, cover the block on to the community and that making my case that it has to be in that sequence. And I'm looking forward to talking about that as well. I am a husband of 27 years to my college sweetheart. That's a total of 32 years we've been together. We have three outstanding daughters. Oldest one is Imani, which means faith. The middle one is Nia, which means purpose. And my baby is uh, Jaya, which means victory. Um, so faith, purpose, and victory are the cornerstones of the White House here um, in College Park, Georgia, off of Old Nat. Um, so I'm excited to be here um, and excited to engage in this concrete conversation um, that's uh, dealing with the Black family. And appreciate you, Brother White. Thank you so much, man. And uh, we are really, really fortunate to have you on uh, our panel as uh, your insight is going to be um, paramount in this discussion, very much. Um, I see young Brother Diallo has come on. Are you there, brother? Yeah, I'm right here. Hey, my man, how you doing? What's up? Oh, how about you? Yeah, I'm good. How about you? Doing well, young brother. Okay, can you get your camera on your face a little bit more? We can barely see. We only see the top of your head. There you are. All right. Look at that young king. Just give an introduction of yourself, man. What did you say? Give a quick introduction of yourself. 
Um, I'm Diallo, I'm 15, and in the 10th grade, and I, uh, yeah, I'm in the 10th grade, and I'm 15. And what school you go to, brother? Um, Tomo Sana Kanyama, TSK. All right. Just waking up? Um, yeah, I was I taking a nap upstairs. We were just talking about that earlier, about how we like to take midday naps, man. So uh, I ain't mad at you for it, brother. But uh, we'll, we'll check in with you, man. Wake up. All right. Brothers, with that, man, let's get started uh, into the discussion. And again, the discussion today, for those that are listening in, is raising a family in today's America. What we're talking about when we say that is um, there's a lot of dynamics in today's America. Um, for, for our young black family specifically, there is a lot of dynamics that we have to manage through. So, um, I'm going to start with, uh, with you, uh, Brother Gary, just to get into that conversation, um, to talk about some of those challenges and how we, we, um, kind of deal with them. Good, no problem. Um, I, I'm excited once again to have this discussion. And you all, we have to put the Black family and, and families in general within context, just in terms of looking at how much has changed literally from, um, from let's say 1960, 1965, during what was known as the Daniel Patrick Moynihan Report to, to, to 2014. And we look at some major transitions really that have taken place in families in general. If you really think about it, that in 1960, 73% of families were in two-parent homes, right? By 1980, 61. By 2014, it literally dropped down to 46%. So we start constantly seeing these um, these challenges and, and I'm, we're just talking about marriage, right? And that even changed within the context of remarriage and how this has even changed over time. Again, when you really think about it in 1960, the percentages of families that existed um, where marriages occurred in first time marriages to by the time we get to 2014 and we began to see that the remarriage and the number or the birth of the blended family. So we have so much in terms of the, what constitute family has changed. And I think that's very important because when we have a conversation about family, we're very clear that this is challenging the, the, the Western view that a family is just the mother, the father, and 2.5 children. And we recognize that within the context of the African-American family, the Black family has always consisted and, and looked at family within the context of not just the parents, but the aunts, the uncles, um, fictive kinships, the play aunts, the play uncles. So we see all this diversity taking place. But some challenges do exist that we're now seeing in terms of Black families that that's a little different now. We begin with when we are struggling with the concept now that 69% of children that are being raised in single parent female headed households. And so now we're seeing something that really has not existed to this degree. However, I don't always get too caught up on such a statistic because I'm very, very clear that the proximity of the father to the children is always neglected. So the daddy may not be in the home when we hear that, but daddy in that regard is in proximity. So his level of access, engagement, and responsibility takes on a completely different look. But here in Georgia, and I know this thing is national, but here in Georgia, we're operating on a whole new um, model here because Georgia has laws that are still in existence since slavery and those attorneys on this line recognize and understand some of those laws that found themselves in real estate. So when you talk about the black family, we're now saying that if a father has a child born out of wedlock, he has no legal rights to his child. Even if he's living with the mother, he has no seat say so to his child. And, and the law in Georgia that takes back to slavery and property says, that he must legitimize the child. These are some structural barriers, Marty, that I'm, I'm highlighting here that a father has to, in order for a father who's not married 
to that mother to have the legal right to be involved with his child at the school, that he must convert that child from being illegitimate to legitimate through a process of legitimation. And even after he's legitimated that child and made that child have his legal last name, he still does not have the right to be physically involved in the child's life because he has to then move forward and do what? He has to then get visitation rights. And so even if the father's living with the mother for schools and institutions who have this preconceived notion that all black families are somehow hostile, then schools deal with whoever the primary parent is. So if a father shows up to the school, they've automatically put the mother's name on the list without the father. And so in order for him to have a right off the times, even some schools, he has to literally take with him, I call them freedom papers, that says he has the right literally to be in his child's life. So the structural impediments that we look at, I'm telling you, still exist today. And that's why oftentimes I make a big distinction between a single mother and a single parent. You have a lot of women out there who are masquerading as single parents, but the truth is they're just single mothers. Because if you are a single mother, um, that makes him a single father. But if you are a single parent, that means you're doing it all by yourself. And you got a lot of women we're not doing it by themselves. So we have several issues and challenges, structurally speaking. And then I'll double back later on. And when we talk about the Black family, just even in terms of some of us as Black men and some of the work that we have got to do, um, because we've taken, some of us have taken the uh, fight or flight concept to a whole new level, a little pressure, a little issue, and we want to bounce. So we have to take a look at all these issues in, ter in terms of understanding some challenges in terms of um, having a greater appreciation for the Black family. So there's work that we have to do. And I've always said it starts with myself as a father and individual onto the family and pouring into the family, covering the block. The block means the men that are in your circle. And the challenge that we have is that we have a lot of brothers who have unhealthy people in their circle who are not there to support them. That's what I love about the Black Man Lab because it's a circle. We are reconstituting the circle of Black men who are gonna hold each other accountable within the context of our involvement. So I'll start with myself, the family covered the block that, um, of that circle of men that support us and then onto the community. So there's something fundamentally wrong if you're doing great work in the community, but your children despise you. You have a strained relationship. So sometimes in this work, in terms of understanding the issues of the black family, we've got to get brothers to retreat for a moment and focus on themselves and family. And that's what the Black Man Lab is doing. Man. <laughs> Well, that was a great show, everybody. Um, <laughs> no, but but Gary, man, that you said so much there um, that that hits home, right? Um, you're absolutely right. First and foremost, uh, Black Man Lab was was created solely for that reason, in that um, there's so many of of us out there that are uh, doing good work, right? We we want to do well for our communities. And we want to do well for society, um, but so often in doing that, um, our, our own winds up getting getting dismissed to a certain degree because the expectation in our mind is, you know, well, they're good, you know, they're with me, they're good, you know. But the reality of it is, is that that they need that that nourishment as well. So um, I 100% I agree on that. And then it was very interesting to touch on the. Um, a single mother and a single parent. Absolutely, uh, we we hear that far too often. Um, and I think that 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 society. When I say society, uh, I'm talking about um, oppressive society, uh, kind of manufactures that as well. You know, when it comes to our community, um, that a lot of times our our our, our women are called single single parents. When the reality is there is a father in the, in the picture um, that is doing the work as well as a parent. Um, so it's really, really good to have. Uh, so I appreciate that. And I'm sure we'll come back much more. So thank you again. Oh, absolutely. Um, um, Brother Durante, uh, as you have, uh, 
you know, you have a family um, in, in today's world. Uh, talk about how you have had to um, pivot and, and move to, to make sure that you are doing uh, all that you can to make sure your family is well. Um, I mean, especially as of recently, there's been a lot of pivoting and, and just alterations, um, you know, with the, with the construct of family. Uh, both my wife and I are entrepreneurs, um, and our children are six and two. One is in first grade, the other is not in school at all. Uh, she was attending daycare. So, you know, one of the biggest adjustments we've had to make is just, you know, how do we balance that? How do we be, how, how are we at home every day? And making sure that, you know, our son is not getting behind in school. And then on, you know, the flip side, you know, making sure our daughter, you know, is picking up all that she needs to pick up and, you know, that she is, uh, you know, staying afloat and staying abreast and, you know, to everything that she needs to be. And, you know, just as entrepreneurs and business owners, you know, what, how are we doing? What, what are we doing? And also the component of that with regard to self-care. Are we taking care of ourselves? Are we taking care of each other? So, you know, in this whole pandemic, you know, it's, it's completely changed the way that we live life. Uh, it's made us a lot more intentional about how we structure things and schedule things and uh, being intentional also about getting out of the house as a family and, you know, not having cabin fever and, and making sure that my wife and I, you know, date and, you know, do all types of other things as well so that the kids are not um, left behind and our marriage is not left behind as well. So it's just one of those things where we just have to, we've had to just navigate and figure it out the best way that we could, uh, you know, but nonetheless, it's working. And I think every day presents a new challenge. And uh, I think the key to everything is communication uh, as a whole, you know, throughout the family and just letting our kids know, even down to our two-year-old, that this is a, this is where we are now. And, you know, here's how the day presents itself and here's how tomorrow will be uh, potentially, but nonetheless, this is our family dynamic and this is what we're doing. So, um, you know, just, just being flexible, I think has been the biggest thing for us so far. And, you know, just, just communicating that flexibility as well and trying to, um, you know, self care as much as possible. I think that's been the biggest thing that we've uh, had to adjust to thus far for sure. Yeah, that's a great point too, Devante. I think the self care, especially for men <clears throat> when, uh, our socialization, kind of alluding to uh, Dr. White's earlier point, our socialization as black men uh, conditions us always to, you know, look at the negative relationships or, or, or make, you know, this thing called building family with a black woman extremely complex and difficult. Perhaps it is, but I think there's a lot of external drama that, that causes just that to be amplified so much. And I can speak from myself as a divorcee and parent, co-parenting uh, in my children's lives. But I wanted to go back to what Gary said when he introduced himself, but he brought a lot of luggage brothers and I just want to unpack one of those bags for our listening audience. Uh, so for all those who watching and listening, tune in. I want to stick right there on this image of black manhood as I'm a member of Let Us Make Man as well. And uh, you know, our tag is the gathering to reclaim black manhood. And so I tie black manhood to black fatherhood and I say that they're inextricable. And so what I would ask the panelists, you know, and each brother can kind of tackle this one, one at a time, is that what do you think the greatest strength of the black family in this 21st century is? Looking at our evolution as Gary documented over the past several years, 50 years in fact, uh, what's the greatest strength of the black family in 2020? Uh, what things are we doing well, brothers, in your opinion, as, as black fathers? Uh, I'll jump out there. Um, I know Dr. White is jumping at the bit, so I'm going to get mine off first <laughs> before he, <laughs> uh, because he says everything so well. I'm also a proud member of Let Us Make Man. And, and you know, that's, that's one of the things that I've learned from the other brothers, just to, um, you know, how to lead basically. And in addition to leading, I think one thing that has happened as it relates to the evolution of family uh, for 
black families in particular, you know, all mom has always been, you know, everything within the household and dad is always the one that goes out, makes the money and things like that. And while that is still true, there was a, there's a, I guess, notion that there's a lack of support in the home and that mom is, you know, to do everything. So I think one thing that I've seen in my circle that, you know, my friends are doing and, you know, men that are close in age to me, they're present. You know what I mean? It's not just left up to mom to take care of the kids and things like that. You know, I know some guys that, you know, get in there and take care of home just as well as mom can. You know what I mean? So just kind of giving that extra support and working together, whether you are married, whether you are, you know, co-parenting, you know, brothers just really showing up and, you know, being present. You know, I think that makes a huge difference. And, you know, that's one of the things that I, I love about my Letters Make Man Brothers is that all that are fathers are present. You know what I mean? And there's no slacking as it relates to that. So it just really pushes me to, you know, continue to do that uh, and be present as well. So that that's one thing for me, from me. Awesome. Awesome. Other brothers, y'all want to weigh in? What are our strengths right now, brothers, in your opinion, as fathers, the Black family? Yeah. I would say that one of our strengths that I see is our level of commitment. Uh, one of the things I noticed when I came to the Black Men's Lab, just watching all these committed brothers to being invested not only into their children, but their families. Um, so I think that our level of commitment has really grown. And I, I know we have all these negative stuff popping into our, our minds about Black men are not this, Black men are not that. But, uh, you know, I, I rock with some solid brothers and, you know, including these brothers on this call. But I think our level of commitment it has, has grown tremendously. Uh, and, you know, I just appreciate it. I appreciate being in these type of spaces where we can see um, brothers doing the work and brothers invested in their children uh, and their families. So I say commitment is one of the things that we're doing quite well. Awesome. I, I think to, to your point, uh, plus more is that, you know, when you see it, it makes you say, okay, that's that's okay to do. That's the thing that I should be doing, you know, and I think that um, Brothers of Let's Make Man, Brothers of uh, Black Man Lab, and there's a bunch of other organizations out there. Yeah. Um, and when we are present amongst ourselves, it becomes, for lack of a better term, contagious. And yeah. uh, so often I think that society has, has um, diminished and demeaned what we are as black men, you know, it becomes psychological. You start believing in some circles that that's, that you start believing it. But then when you see groups of men like what we have right here on this panel, um, it definitely changes the paradigm and the thought process of how you think about yourself. I, I can look at, I can look at Doc White and say, I can see myself in him, you know, um, that gives me a different sense of self, right? Um, if I can look at Durante and see, ah, okay, he's like-minded like me, that gives me a different sense of self. So um, I appreciate your point, brother. Brother um, Monty, you have yes. some feedback on? No, I, I was just gonna, just to kind of echo and, and, and peck, piggyback off of what has been said thus far. I think our our awareness of our responsibility is something that has, um, at least within my circle has um, really kind of, we've been, been able to focus in on the responsibility that we have, um, recognizing, understanding that we are under attack in a lot of ways and understanding that there is very little we can do about those outside forces. But what we can do is be present, like like uh, Durante was saying, and and be uh, aware and, be, and, and, and take responsibility for showing our children um, what what it's going to mean to be black and navigate this world. I think that you know my parents' generation um, did everything that they could to provide me uh, with the opportunities that they didn't have. Um, and along with that, and this is not a knock, but w along with that, sometimes can't meant shielding you from some of that pain and some of that. Um, some of those outside forces that if you're not careful can, can, can confront you when you become an adult in a very real and, and sometimes tragic way. And so 
I don't plan to, to, to do that. And again, that's not a knock on my parents' generation because I'm grateful forever and eternally grateful for what they were able to do for me and the choices that they made that changed the trajectory of my life. But I know that one thing I can do perhaps a little differently is make sure that my son is, is aware is as soon as he is, has the ability to discern between right and wrong and good and evil is make him aware of who he is um, to me and his mother but also who he is to the world. And those are not always the same thing and he needs to be prepared for what that's gonna look like. So I think our awareness of that reality is something that I, at least I have found and observed within my circle of, of fathers that I'm, that I'm close with. I think that's something that we've, we've all kind of understood in maybe ways that we didn't even a few years ago. I'm gonna take a shot at it and say um, a few things that I think in terms of the strength of black fathers and how it impacts the black family. Number one, our resiliency. You know, the, the, you know we are, uh, our history, so since the moment that we were kidnapped and brought to these shores as black men and now fathers, we are resilient by nature. And so that resiliency we'll see when um, economic downturn and, and we've learned to be resilient because what have we seen? You know, when, when the, when the uh, unemployment rate hit 12% for black men, the, uh, that for us it was 15%. So the resiliency, even when I look at um, brothers like uh, Monty and Durante, where you listen to how diverse they are, that's the resiliency as father. You have this man said that I am an attorney and I also run a catering service. So that resiliency is a type of thing that we see in terms of black men. But here's what's very, very important as well. And that is, there's a distinction. The research has constantly shown that black men put a different value on fatherhood than our white counterparts. And here's what I mean. Our white counterparts have been socialized to be doers. They're doing, right? So um, a rugged individualism, the job, the competitive market, as long as the wife or somebody's there feeding them, putting food on the table, then they assume that the children are good. But for black men, we put the value on being there. And I always tell people there's a big difference between being a father and doing a father. When you do fatherhood, that means that you didn't put food on the table, you made sure the bills are paid and all that. But guess what? You have a lot of fathers who do that work, but then their children say, you did all that, daddy, but the being, I needed you to be there. So for black men, the value we put on being there is critical. And I also, also like what you all said, we are at war in this image this imagery in social media. You know, there's one thing worse than having low expectations of a black man, and that is having no expectations. And so you know that's what it looks like because anytime we do something in, in society, people look at it to, uh, and, and look at it as being exceptional. So when my daughters were young, we were in the grocery store and I broke out a brush and, and put their hair back in a barrette, you see people clapping as if there was some stuff that I did that was exceptional. But that exceptionalism in terms of our caring, our commitment, and our consistency are undoubtedly the strengths of, the, of, of Black men as fathers. And guess what? I'm going to say this too. When I look at Diallo and the work and the responsibility that we have of moving the boyhood into manhood, these characters Characteristics of things that we must ensure that we embed upon them so that they can not just be doers in terms of owning your own business, but beers as well in terms of being there. So I close by saying there's a difference between believing it and the be lived experience. So what black men deal with as fathers, it is our be lived experience. We believe in it, we're, it's our being, and we're living it as well. Yes, sir. Thanks. <laughs> hey, man, the, the, the conversation is, is great, man. And I love having this conversation because it opens up so much of um, what goes on, I think, in all of our minds, right? We are, I think, guys like ourselves and a lot of those listening in and, and um, those that are part of, of good Black men organizations have this mindset um, of things that you were just talking about, uh, Brother Gary, and um, we have to we have to continue that, and we have to continue that, and we have to push that for the next generation. Um, just because 
to, to Monty's point, you know, he's talking about his parents and and they did all they could, and likewise mine, um, done all they could, you know, for me. Um, I appreciate it beyond beyond words. But what we have to do is go to that next level, right? And that next level, um, from there, our children should be going to the next level above us, you know, so that ultimately this world that we live in it, it's to a place we're not where we are today. Right? We've seen what we're seeing today is uh, reminiscence of, of what we saw in the 60s, realistic. Um, so, so obviously we have to do some things different. And I think the major thing that we have to do is build our families because that has been the destruction of the world. Every round Growing goes higher. Black family and how a better way. Yeah, I'm saying every round goes higher and higher. And that's what Monty was talking about. My parents did good. I love what they did, but I got to kick it to the next level. I don't want my children to, I mean, my, my goal is that um, I remember being young and, you know, my, my mom raising all five of us by herself. And I tell everybody I'm one of 23 kids, but my mom raised all five of us in terms of that first group by herself. And I used to admire when I looked at the brothers who had both of their parents um, raising them. And so I was very clear that when I became an adult, because I could see the difference. The first time I ever went to a national convention of, uh, of my fraternity, um, I had to go gather myself in, the, uh, in 1990, I had to go back to my room and gather myself because I saw brothers there who were alphas with their fathers and their grandfathers. And I'm looking at three generations of men and I never saw that. So I became very clear that when my turn came, I wanted to make sure that my daughters had all the education that their hearts wanted and I've done. I had to make sure that I created the, the type of black family that I wish I had as a child. And that if we can, when we are able to do just that as black men to say, guess what? This is the type of marriage I wish my parents had. I'm gonna have that. This is the type of relationship with the children and that I wish I had with my parents. I'm gonna have that. And when we start doing that, as Monty has shared and Durante has shared, then the rounds go higher and higher. That's the only obligation we have. This ain't about changing the nation. It ain't changing about changing our tribes. I'm just saying, if you can just make a personal private promise to yourself, to however it was as a child, and however you wished it could be as a child, now you are up to the plate, do it. And that's the positive, powerful side of our Black fathers in today's society. We have the opportunity to do it in the way that we wished it had been done as children. Absolutely, absolutely. And, that, and that's, it's the promise, right? That's, that's the thing that, that keeps me going, and I think that keeps all of all the brothers that we have going is that, that promise of if I push for if I do all that I you know for me I'm a little different than you I have both parents and God bless this both still alive if I could be as good as my dad and maybe a little bit better and my son got a little bit more my girls got a little bit more than that we're gonna be all right right we're gonna be all right so that's that's. That's the promise, man. And that's what I think um, we as black men and what the Black Man Lab is all about is building that. And, and um, you know, somebody talked about leadership earlier, um, mentioned the word leadership. Leadership starts at home, right? We start with leading at home. Then we can, then from there, you can move out into your community, you know, most friends, wherever else. Um, but it starts at home because you're also building future. So, um, man, we go on and on. I gotta, I'll start talking. That's not what I want to do. I just want y'all to talk. Um, young Brother Diallo, uh, uh, you are, you've been in Black Man Lab. You've been, been in the space. Um, what do you think is the most important um, thing that you've gotten out of uh, being in the space, but then also in terms of your family? What do you think is the most important thing for you? Um, my, what I think is the most important thing is like family. 
Yeah. Um, like everybody, um, like keeping each other accountable and stuff, and uh, like being a friend and like uh, tell like when someone does something, you tell them, hey, that's not. You pull them to the side and say, hey, that's not right. Something like that, yeah. Hold everyone accountable, and um, so everyone can get things done. I yeah, love it. I yeah, love I love it. that man. Talking about accountability. How old are you, brother? Y'all, you fifteen? You said? Yeah, I'm fifteen. Ooh, yeah, dude. I, I wasn't talking about accountability at fifteen. So, no. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all, Marty. I was thinking Diallo's father's hand is right on him. We can hear it and see it. Uh, outstanding young man. Glad to have you on because uh, one day we pray you're going to be a father leading a household. But yeah, brothers, I, I start with strength because I want our listeners to believe and to know those who, who appreciate and embrace the situation they're in as a father or a husband or, or, or one or the other. Uh, but then also those who have some doubts. And I know from being in Let Us Make Man over the past 13, 14 years, Gary's workshop is attended a lot by families or people who want to find to make their family better. And so I would just ask, you know, now that we've talked about the strengths and we listed them brilliantly, you know, what are some immediate threats given the climate we're in to your families, brothers, that that you say, man, I've been battling this threat right here, um, you know, for a long time, or a new emerging threat with with how you know the police are behaving and the schools are broken. So, you know, what about the threats, brothers, to your families and your experience? Things that you can tell young dads or other dads that they need to be looking out for uh, when raising their own family. May I go first on this one? And I'll be short. Um, it starts with self talk. The greatest threat that we have is the conversation that we have for ourselves and we don't run it by a healthy circle. So number one, our self-talk and we don't take those thoughts out and run them through the circle. And number two, a strong circle. Diallo just hit a doggone home run in the point that he just made in terms of having a circle of someone that can you can go to and hold you accountable. But our threat is, is that when we engage in this self-talk and we start talking about giving up, we start talking about quitting, we stop communicating. Um, the greatest challenge that we have sometimes is that, you know, people often say that women are more emotional than men, and I challenge it. The only difference between men and women in terms of emotions is that women's emotions are external. They talk about and they say it. men's emotions are internal. And the problem with the internal as a threat is that you have an implosion. And when you have that implosion, you quit, you give up, you walk away, you curse, you do those things. But what is the serum to that unhealthy self-talk is a very, very strong circle. If you don't have the people in your circle to hold you accountable, if there's nobody in your circle to say, brother, you wrong. If there's no one in your circle to check you and everybody's saying, you know what, I'm not going to get in your family business. I'm going to tell everybody it ain't their business, but it is their business. If I'm in your circle, then you have a right to put me in check when I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. So the self-talk and the self-defeating um, mm -hmm. uh, low level of emotional intelligence within that regard and an unhealthy circle. Some of our circles, we need a colonic. We need a total cleansing of the people <laughs> who are in our circle because we are having these diarrhea-like ideas coming from this unhealthy circle. So that's my argument. <laughs> Told the brother that the other day, man. Clean your friends out, bro. What about you, brothers? What are some threats you see that you want to warn brother, other fathers about? I, I would add to that um, very, very sim similarly, um, and I and I, I learned this. My my partner is a, is a social worker by by training and is a therapist uh, in practice. Uh, and one of the things that she always talks about and stresses is is boundaries. I think a big threat to us is we do not have um, collectively. Uh, an understanding of the importance of boundaries, and we don't understand how to communicate to others when we do set boundaries, communicate to others why that boundary is there and what that boundary means. And so it allows 
negative um, energy to permeate our relationships. You know, just because you set up a boundary doesn't mean you've walled someone off. It just means that their energy cannot invade your energy because when it does, it imp impacts your home. And so in our home, things that we're always mindful of with one another is setting those healthy boundaries. There's only so much our mothers can say to us right. about our relationship, right? There's only so much our friends can say about this and that. There's only so much uh, parenting advice we're going to take, right? Because at the end of the day, our home is, is for the two of us to manage and to run. And so too often, I know that a lot of the clients that she sees, that she counsels, one of the you know, the, 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 the universal thread that uh, goes through all of their, their issues is that they have not figured out how to set healthy boundaries, both for themselves and for their relationships. And I think that wow. is a huge, huge threat wow. to uh, family and to just, just personal self-care and mental health. It really, it really, really is. And if we can tackle that, I think we, I mean, we shoot ourselves way, way, way farther ahead than where we currently are. Man, I hope the listeners are taking notes, man, and tuned in because y'all brothers are dropping some real gems tonight. Uh, I think, like you said, Brother Monty, the boundaries are important even for the individual self-care, let alone by extension to the family. Uh, that's a part of the security, bro. Absolutely. Come on, so Brother Samari and Durante. Yeah, I think uh, just to piggy, piggyback rather off of what Monty just said regarding boundaries, man, that's something that I had to learn. I don't want to necessarily say the hard way, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you, you know, might have a friend that it was introduced to fatherhood before you or, you know, your parents or whatever. And it's one of those things whereby, you know, accepting advice for them based on how they do their home doesn't always, it's right. not a one size fit all situation or whatever so it's one of those things where you have to figure out with your co-parent with your partner or whatnot you know what's what's good for us and how do we operate in this right. situation um but I, I think you know but what both dr white and monty have shared uh with regard to that are excellent threats uh that we should be mindful of you know one of the things that uh you mentioned uh brother Priam, regarding threats would be, you know, external threats regarding how the police treats us and things like that. You know, I have a six year old and I've not, I've introduced him slowly, you know, to some of these issues that, you know, I'm going out to protest for and, you know, things like that. So he can have an understanding as to why, um, you know, but that's one of my biggest things right now is just trying, what can I do now to make the world better for him, you know, later? Because, you know, our walk might be a little bit different um, you know, later on, you know, whereas with me, I, I was in a position where I had to maybe be street smart or whatever, you know what I mean, to kind of understand how, how those things operate and, you know, raising my son a little bit differently so that he does not have to experience some of those things that I experienced at a young age. So how does that look to him? You know what I mean? So that, that's one of the biggest things, just kind of teaching him about those external factors and how they don't play a role in our house and how we, how he should address them, you know, as he gets older, basically. Yeah, uh, I would add that the culture is a, the current culture that we're in now is a huge threat. Um, I have my sons now in the rites of passage that me and some other brothers are doing. And Dr. Raymond Winbush, uh, who wrote the Warrior Method, he came to address them. And he was telling them that if we spend more time watching TV than we do reading, then we mm -hmm. have to reevaluate what mm. we're doing as men. Mm. And I think the culture has such a distractive type culture. What's the latest video game? What's the latest TV program? What's the latest this and that? And before you know it, we don't spend, he, he just laid out how many hours black people watch TV in general. And we don't spend a majority of our day listening to things that doesn't even mean anything to us. So I think we have to be aware of the culture that they try to slide into our households on a day-to-day -day basis. We have to be mindful of what our children are looking at, what they're watching, what they're engaged in, and just keeping an eye on them. And it's not in the sense of just, and I, I, I think when we get that teenage age, it's like I'm independent. But at the same time, we want to make sure that our children are being held to a level of standards that they can grow up to be successful and, and good men like they see 
um, that, you know, they're around. So we want to get them to that place and we have to be really aware of the culture that exists, that is a constant threat in our households, in our communities. And this being negative has been so popularized to right. where we think mm -hmm. that being negative is cool. Negative is okay. So we have to reevaluate, you know, how we look at things and how we teach that to our children and, you know, hold them accountable to it is what Diallo said earlier, the accountability factor, I think is important, so. Man, absolutely. Um, you guys are just, as, as Fred said earlier, just dropping gems left and right. And uh, I'm taking notes as, as we're going through myself, so. Me too, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, because the reality of it is, is that as, as a parent, um, and as, as a person in today's society, we really don't have anything figured out. We know that, right? We don't have it all figured out. There's only one person that got stuff figured out, and he's up there, right? That, that's the creator. Um, we're, we're trying to move in a way that is uh, conducive to what the creator would want. Um, and, and I think that that's important. Um, D, did you have another point? Did you want to drop in? Here? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to um, just add, you know, the interesting thing is, an, is another thread too, is um, what I call deficit parenting. And that is raising our children by what not to do. You know, we're telling them, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. And what ends up happening is that when 99% of the instruction we give our children is based on what not to do, then you find our children doing it as opposed to what to do. And when we have that strength-based approach to our parenting, something wonderful begins to happen. Our children start learning from us. And to some degree, I'm all, I, I get to say, you almost know when you're doing it, when you find your children, when they start moving into that next level of young adulthood, they've chosen a profession or a career or a major that's kind of like yours, right? So that strength-based thing is beginning to happen, right? So I just remember with Molly, when Kahari and Kobe uh, got ready when, in high school, leaving, and, and I remember telling Molly once to say, one of them going to law school, Molly was like, no, nah, I don't see it. I don't see it. If he watch it, I know he's going to jump on. I said, you watch it, right? <laughs> so what ends up happening is that you have Kobe who has an interest in law, and then you look at the creativeness of Kahari, which is literally the creativeness of his mom as an educator. I'm a social worker. I'm a social work educator, practitioner, therapist, and my children for the longest. Dad, I cannot do the work you do. I cannot do it. But what ended up happening? My oldest daughter gets her master's degree in public health. My middle daughter gets her uh, her bachelor's degree, Texas A&M, in what? Community health. My youngest daughter in Tuskegee is what? A veterinarian. Help, help, help. And so what the weird thing is that what they, it's not so much what we do, but, but, but it's, 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 it's not so much what we say, but it's what we do. And then they start following in those. So the strength-based uh, parenting is really the, uh, the, the counter to the negative. Because I'm going to tell you, I don't worry about racism, um, institutional, structural, micro. I'm not worried about any of those things because the strength in the house is so strong that I got daughters and I'm raising them as warriors. And so that's that strength-based approach and not so much the deficit-based approach. And I think that's a great counter to the negativism. And I think it's a great counter to what we need to do in those, in terms of those areas or those opportunities for improvement for us as, as, as Black fathers. So, so can I ask a question right quick? So, Dr. White, you're talking about when you're saying the strength based approach, could you just elaborate on that just a little bit? Because I was writing some of that down. That was oh, no, no problem. Strength based approach is um, because there's been so much negativity and we are fighting social media images, we're fighting the pre, uh, the level of fear that officers have. So what ended up happening is that from that, uh, that deficit approach, we start telling our children what not to do. You know, um, when the police come, don't do this. When you're dealing with it, and so everything becomes what not to do, what not to do. It's mm -hmm. sort of like if I told everybody in this room, no matter what, don't look up, don't look up, don't look up. Someone is going to look up. 
right? So we start, we put so much energy or directing them toward what not to do, then they start looking at that. And all I'm simply saying, the counter to it is focusing on the strength of what to do, because guess what? It's sort of like when I teach my students about, um, um, I can learn more when I'm studying the black family. Uh, so much research focuses on divorce, right? Divorce, divorce, divorce. As if, if we learn about what causes people to divorce, it's somehow gonna help us understand what keeps people married. And I argue, guess what? I don't do that deficit. Here's what I'm gonna start. What makes a relationship strong? And what are they getting right? And if I can understand what they getting right, then I can go back and look at perhaps someone who's got it wrong. But we do that, um, it's sort of like a recovering addict becomes the expert in dealing with substance abuse, right? I had to tell one time in a group, I said, so do I need to break from this group, go and do crack, get addicted, come back, so then I can be an expert? No, we don't, we learn from the strengths perspective of doing it. So when we give that attention, then every opportunity interaction we have with our kids becomes opportunities. Daddy, how are you an attorney and you have a, a catering business? Daddy, I like that lion's den. Where did that come from, son? Let me tell you about it. So now the dialogue, when Parham's son started medical school, everyone was looking right. Why? Because he's following in a very interesting way in that, uh, in that regard. And Parham's daughter is getting a master's degree in social work. And I got her. Y'all see what I mean? So that's the strength base when we're doing it and our children start feeding off of it and eating off of it. And whatever it is that my daddy is doing, I want to move. And y'all, we'll have another conversation about the power of the daddy-daughter relationship and, and how daughters transform men. And we have to take a closer look at that phenomenon. Hmm. Thank you. you. You know I do. So having, having two daughters and, and uh, and, and having gone down that road, I absolutely want to have that conversation. Um, and to, your, to, your, to your point too, also, Gary, uh, you know, you talk about uh, th those positive conversations rather than focusing on what not. Um, it's interesting how it'll it'll manifest later, right? Mm -hmm. Your point, whether it's something in a profession or whether it's just that they were actually listening and you never thought that they were, you know, um, when you hear, you remember when you said, you know, it'll be years later and then it'll be, <laughs> dad, you remember when you said, I, 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 whatever it was, then you're like, you're like, whoa, that was it. That was the moment, you know, that was the moment where, where you know that they got it. So, um, yeah, I, I completely understand it. Man, guys, we are pushing up against the clock. Um, so I want to get some more in here. Um, before, before we have to get off, um, but I, I want to, one thing that I want to talk about and I want us to touch on um, that I'm sure is affecting everybody is, you know, it's about today's society, right? So we have, we have COVID, we have um, the, the beach situations going on, we have um, a crazy political system going on right now. Um, how are you having those conversations with your family? What does that look like for you? I know for me personally, it's, it's weird because we wind up having these roundtable discussions now that I've never had before that are um, both insightful in terms of me being able to expound upon all the different things that are going on in today's world from you know, institutional racism to politics, whatever. Um, and then getting that feedback and hearing, hearing these young folks' point of view. Um, how has that occurred in you all's homes? Um, I'll, start, I'll start with you, Brother Durante. Talk to, us a little, talk to us a little bit about that. I think the biggest thing that uh, we've done, you know, because my son is six, so he, he doesn't have the best understanding uh, of what's going on, you know, regarding uh, the political piece but we are at least exposing him to it and just kind of teaching him about uh, the bipartisanship of American politics and, you know, who the players are as it relates to that, who Donald Trump is, who, 
you know, Joe Biden is and things like that. So slowly bringing him along as it relates to that so that he can, you know, have an understanding generally of, you know, what's going on. And they're also having some of those conversations in school as well. I was surprised to hear, you know, that his teacher is teaching a little bit about government, and, you know, things like that through social studies. So, uh, you know, as far as that piece, you know, we're teaching them about that. With the pandemic, um, this thing just kind of hit us out of nowhere. And, you know, he, he was in kindergarten when this first started. And uh, fortunately for him, he had some, I guess, date, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, schooling under his belt with regards to virtual learning. So when, it did, when everything initially happened, you know, we had to explain to him what was going on and the reason why. So he gets it and, you know, he's able to give us that feedback to say, you know, well, outside of school, you know, other things are going on as well where we can't operate you know, as we used to, or norm, by normal, if you will. Um, you know, so it's just really open dialogue and just getting that feedback from him as a six-year-old and trying to see from his lens. And then also my wife and I setting, you know, setting the tone as it relates to what are our values in our home and how do we see things and, you know, what's our perspective and not, not necessarily projecting that on them, but sharing our feedback with them as it relates to that and also hearing at least my son's feedback uh, in regards to the same. So, totally for sure. Got you, got you, understood, man. Um, what about you, Brother Samar? Yeah, um, like Durante, we're doing the same thing in terms of like the discussions, having discussions at night. Um, now, one thing I think that's important too, even during this, this whole pandemic and everything, is like we have game nights and things like that to kind of lighten the load. Um, so understanding what's happening on the political spectrum, understanding what's happening uh, in life in general, but just getting the child's perspective as to how they feel about everything and just being open and, you know, having open discussions and family discussions. So that's what we kind of doing. Right? Sure. And, you know, I think it's interesting that when I think about where these kids are today, these young folks, I shouldn't just say kids, but, you know, even, even into their early 20s, where they are today versus, I'll speak for myself, when at me at that age or younger, I wasn't engaging in these kind of conversations. So, you know, it was, it was all, you know, roses and good times for me back then, you know, as much as possible um, versus now. Um, there's, there's all these different topics that are, that are heavy that young folks are getting introduced to. Like, what you were talking, both of you guys were just talking about having young kids, you know, Durante, a six-year-old that is having a discussion now about politics and, and not just textbook politics, but what's happening today is so much deeper than what you know, me at six or eight, I'm sure most of us even thought about. You know, it was even in, our parents weren't, weren't bringing us into those kind of conversations because they were doing what they had to do. You know, at the time, so it's been, it's interesting that that all this is occurring at the same time of COVID. So it puts you in this kind of a, for lack of a better term, bubble. Right, right. It, it provides the opportunity for us to have this conversation. I agree. Um, Brother Monty, what about you? So it's a uh, it's a little little different in our house because our our son is uh, he's not quite two he'll be two in a couple of months so he has no you know uh, uh, understanding or appreciation for what's going on. God, but, God bless him. <laughs> but, right, right, yeah, the, <laughs> that 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 innocence. But you yeah. also you know you all remember when your children were young, like literally every day you can see them becoming a different person and knowing more and understanding more and becoming more curious and more independent and all that. But what we've done is we have been purposeful about, um, about being present because, you know, when we, when the pandemic first started and everything shut down, you know, we, daycare closed, right. And we're both, you know, very busy. I got clients I have to deal with and, and, and my partner has clients she has to deal with. And we had to literally take turns watching him, right? Because while some of her clients may have been okay with having a baby on the, on the lap during their session, most weren't. So that meant that we had to make a lot of sacrifices for one another um, so that we could make sure that he was not an afterthought all day because kids understand those things. Um, 
and we and it was and it was it was hard work and and um i'm proud of us for it not never there weren't really any tense moments between the two of us but it it was a, there was a lot of sacrificing going on before our daycare opened back up um but so for us it's been about really holding to the values that we said we were going to have as a as a as a family and reminding ourselves of that that you know you're you're kind of when when times get tough you really circle the wagons and are are required to lean on the on 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 the the values that you that you claim to have right and so for us it's been it's been about that we said we wanted to be present in our son's life we wanted him to know that he was loved we wanted him to not feel like we were pushing him to the side well when it would have been easy to just be like here let's give him some cough medicine and let okay, him take a nap so we can work we, we you know we resisted those urges we didn't really have those urges you know what i mean we we really were purposeful about making sure that we did the things that we said we were going to do when we decided to start a family and so um for us i think that's really what that's 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 been about but we've also talked about what we would do man if he were if he were uh, of school age, you know what, we probably would have done K-12 and been virtual until we felt comfortable sending, you know, sending him back to school. I mean, we talked about the kinds of things we would be doing if we, if our child was older and was of school age and if we're in a different situation. And that's just the communication, the pattern of communication that we have um, regularly. So I, I think, um, you know, for us, it's been a little bit different. In a lot of ways, we have not been as um, I guess stressfully impacted by the pandemic because our our son is so small. But in other ways, you know, we've had to because he's not as independent as a six year old or a seven year old. We've had to, you know, really lean on one another to make sure that there aren't any gaps in in his development and in our presence in his life. So that's great stuff. And it, it, you know, to your point, it's um, that that period of time, right? That that early period that. You know, mm -hmm. newborn to probably three, four years old, it goes by so fast, man. And it's so intense that what you're talking about right now is, is of utmost importance. That, that level of being in present is, is probably one of the most important things that you have starting out because it sets the tone for you going forward. But then also, I think personally, I think that what that does for you as a parent is is um, unprecedented. You know, you, you it's such a short period of time. It goes by like that. I see kids now all the time. Whenever I see a little kid, and there's a parent with them. I, the first thing I say is enjoy that. Enjoy yeah. that because <laughs> I get that a lot. I, I a lot of people tell me. That. Oh man, it's it, it's it's special, man. It's it's yeah. special because. That's that's the building of all the bonds, man. Look, we are running up against the clock. Um, I want to bring uh, before before we we start wrapping up here. I want to bring Young Diallo in, um, young brother. You you are experiencing um, the world in a different way right now. As as a young teenager, um, you're in a you're in the middle of the pandemic. You're going to school differently. You're seeing stuff um, on the news all the time. A lot of negativity. Um, in the world going on, what what is your perspective, and how do you stay in a positive space right now? Tell us about that real quick, but as we wrap up, you're on mute, y'all. Yeah, could you say the question again? It's loud here. Sure. Um, so so how how are you dealing with all the things that you are seeing today, right now? In, 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 Society, right? You got a pandemic we're dealing with, so I'm sure you're probably doing school virtually. Um, you also are uh, all negativity on the news all the time. Tell us about that. How are you? How are you staying positive? Better. Yeah, it's like um, I feel like like getting into everyone's mind, like. I'm not thinking of like everyone's not thinking about what's the real problem here because we still got something that's like going or like go, happening in the whole world and we're like still fighting and like all of us are dying now it's not just like black people from brutality and everything and i'm not saying that that's justified but i'm saying that 
Corona has messed with people's minds and uh, online school is bad. So, yeah. We, when you say bad, meaning it, it, it's it's bad. How, you know, yes, brother? It it um it's stressful. There there's usually more work because you're like at home, and sometimes people still go to the schools and stuff. So it's just. It's a lot. It's and then just being in the house all day doing nothing. It's it's really like it's stressful and it's boring. Yeah, stressful and boring. That's online school. I get you, man. We 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 as uh grown folks, we have to deal with it as well. I think the vast majority of us are now doing probably more work than what we used to do because we are online all the time doing these Zoom meetings and all that. So I understand that, young Diallo, but at the same time, I'm gonna tell you, young man, keep pushing and keep doing your work and, and read, man. Read as much stuff as you can. Um, so that when we come out of this, you are gonna be strong soldier for, for your community, my man. Um, listen, everybody, we are up against it. And, um, it has been an amazing conversation. Going uh, by too fast, Marty. Too fast. Marty. I mean, today it seems like it's just as as most of our days nowadays, Fred, they go by so fast. But this session went by super fast. Man. Indeed. Um, I, I I want to uh, go ahead and, and start heading us out to a close. Um, Brother Gary, did you was there anything that you wanted to say real quick? No, I was just going to share that within in my home, um, it, it, the emphasis is that this is a history making moment. And we emphasize that everything that takes place right now is going to be in a history book. Um, uh, Durante and Monty, um, those of you who all have little kids, they're going to have to study this. And you all are going to be there and put in context what this moment was like. And so, yeah, the conversations that we all are having, like the conversation you all are having, you're going to remind them of that dialogue when they get to my children's age. So with my older, with my, my youngest child who's at Tuskegee, we FaceTime on a daily basis. They're having a conversation about vaccinations. My daughter's like, Dad, Tuskegee, we good. We already took one for the team, you know? And <laughs> 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 history in of itself um, in that regard. So um, that's the dialogue. And of course, because all of my children are in the helping field, um, you know, they're taking this stuff to heart. And so, but, as, but that's where we are. And that's the beautiful thing about being fathers in the black family is that we are literally bringing in the entire family along. So I close with start with myself, then the family cover the block onto the community. What everybody witnessed today was a discussion about ourselves and our families. That's awesome, man. Appreciate you so much, Doc. Um, Molly, you there, man? We're in the dark, brother. We're on these dark, dusty roads heading back uh, to Atlanta, man. But it's, it's been a beautiful conversation, man. Uh, me and Brother Moody are here together. Um, we just thank you, brothers, for for all that you all are doing. Um, and just, you know, especially our, our, our young brother. You know, we know that this isn't the most optimal way to learn, but um, we got this. We've done this for many, many times before, just in different ways as a people. So um, we're going to close out. If everybody can uh, take yourself off of mute, great. lift your arms up like you're locking arms with us uh, as we do. And what we say, and if you would repeat after me, this is something that was given to us by Queen and Jerry Algani, uh, one of our, our, our she's an ancestor now, but a beautiful spirit that that walked this earth in the area of Atlanta. Uh, she's originally from Detroit, and uh, she would tell us, and you can repeat after me, I am a link in this chain. I am a link in this link chain. In this chain. Okay. And it won't break here. And it won't break, it won't here. break here. I am a link in this chain. I am a link in, this, link chain. in this chain. And it won't break here. And, and it, it won't, and break, it won't here. break here. We are linked in this chain. 
we are linked in this chain. chain. And we won't break here. And, and we won't break, break here. here. Yeah. I say. I say. I say. I say. Travel brothers, safe, brothers. Thank you so much, you guys. I appreciate you all. Thank you for sharing, sharing about your family, your lives, um, and, and your information, man. It's what we gotta keep doing. We gotta keep pushing together and stay linked. Stay linked to this chain. So thank you all, man. Love y'all. Peace, fam. Peace, brothers.